Hello, everybody. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. So, yeah, I'm Ali. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks, uh, Lehak, for giving us these nice t shirts. Because, uh, yeah, indeed, I lost my luggage during my travel. So, yeah, that's a fun fact. And I jumped here from another conference. So, jet lag, but yeah, uh, I'm really happy to be here and uh, yeah, welcome you guys. Um, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, cybersecurity reduction by taking advantage of uh, machine learning based algorithms, uh, especially uh, a case study on intrusion detection system, which I did before during uh, half technical, half academic work. So if you are ready, uh, we can uh, start in the session. A uh, little about me. Uh, yeah, I'm a security enthusiast and working around uh, 10 years. And right now, I'm a security engineer at Picnic Technologies. And uh, I really love research, etc. these kind of things. And also, uh, I'm a reviewer at Springer Journal Cluster Computing, and uh, as well as I uh, was a reviewer as well at OS Global Apps Tech US, and also Hack9 magazines. And I'm a, a frequent speaker, internet trainer at uh, some industry conferences like DEF CON, uh, uh, I don't know, Confidence, No Name Con, and too many besides. And yeah, but I'm really happy uh, today to be here at uh, LEHAC, which is a very, very great and interesting conference. And yeah, that's, that was a little about uh, myself. So we can uh, uh, go over the presentation by starting uh, to talk about the intrusion detection tools and uh, systems, some basics and principles that I know that so most of you know about uh, these kind of principles. So basically, uh, we had a different type of intrusion detection or prevention systems before, uh, like in last uh, 10 years, 20 years, in past several years, we used a different type of uh, intrusion detection systems. And also, once we wanted to uh, have some kind of prevention and blocking and uh, enforcing some kind of policies after detection, we used uh, IPS. And in some cases, uh, we used uh, IDPS solution, which is a combination solution with uh, ITS and intrusion prevention system together. And also, we used uh, different type of IDS and IPS like on or uh, machines and endpoint by deploying uh, host-based IDS, host-based IPS, and also uh, this is the same story for uh, intrusion prevention system as well. And in some cases, we use the uh, host-based IDS, IPS, or within the other solution like internet security, antiviruses, anti-malvers, together within a, within a uh, total security solution. And uh, in most cases also, we use uh, IDS and IPS. Once we want to deploy it and have a better vision and understanding about the traffics and malicious attempts within our network perimeters and internal communication as well. So and the next one will be firewall. So we had uh, different challenges with the stateless firewalls before. And after that, we had uh, state full firewalls, and nowadays, uh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to talk about the UTM or Unified Threat Management, which actually, uh, uh, we don't use uh, those kind of solutions anymore, but yeah, it was uh, some kind of total solution, including uh, antiviruses, uh, IDS, IPS, everything together in a, a unified, uh, box, even virtual or hardware. Uh, and nowadays, uh, we are hearing about the next generation firewalls. Uh, so we are hearing that the, uh, too many vendors and companies all around the world are trying to tackle the vulnerabilities and uh, malicious attempts and uh, some kind of suspicious or behavior, uh, malicious behaviors 
by deploying different type of NGFW. But what, what would be the next option? And uh, in some rare case, uh, NGFWs, uh, they're pretending to use some kind of uh, you know, AI things within their solution. So right now, the, the topic will be this uh, issue, AI in intrusion detection system. Yeah, we have uh, two main uh, intrusion detection system varieties. Traditional IDSs, which were based on the, some predefined rules and uh, signatures, as you know. So uh, you had some rules, and you have to update the rules every day, every week, you know. It was a must because if you wanted to have an up-to-date solution to keep your perimeters safe, uh, you had to update your uh, intrusion detection system uh, within uh, some time plans, actually. And uh, also, the next generation will be some kind of anomaly-based intrusion detection system or even uh, AI. So what about AI actually? Uh, how we can take advantage of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, by deploying this kind of stuff within our own IDS? Or even we, how we can uh, deploy and set up our own IDS based on different machine learning patterns? So I mentioned about the traditional intrusion detection system. So let's talk about the traditional one. So basically, as I said before, uh, you had to uh, update because you were using uh, some predefined parameters, some predefined signatures, rules, and uh, it was a, it was a, some kind of uh, predefined procedure that uh, the solution was take a look at the, all the traffic to, to find any matches within the ba database or the knowledge base, which was the, the, some, some sort of patterns and signatures. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's really not a suitable solution right now. Nowadays, there are too many uh, uh, possible ways to bypass these kind of uh, security solutions actually. And uh, if I want to talk about pitfalls of these kind of solutions, uh, I can mention about the uh, dependency of some predefined signatures which are bypassable by some sort of uh, techniques like packet segmentation and fragmentation, uh, spoofing on poor source port or uh, source IP, I would say. And yeah, that, that's, the, that, that's the problem, that we cannot say that uh, using this kind of solution, any kind of solution, not only an uh, intrusion detection system, any kind of solution within the predefined signatures, within the predefined algorithms would be a best solution for our organization. And uh, defending uh, on our network perimeters or even internal communications as well. So, oh, yeah, how we can use uh, artificial intelligence or even machine learning patterns and models uh, in intrusion detection system solution or building our next generation IDS. So, in fact, we have to use it because, first, it's scalable, so you can extend your own solution whenever you want. And also, you can uh, share within different communities, within different open source communities as well. Nowadays, too many people, too many universities, too many organizations all around the world are trying to deploy uh, open source uh, culture all around the world. You know, it's, it's very important. We are talking about uh, open source Spark Bounty, open source uh, X, YZ, you know, and also it is possible to take advantage of open source communities uh, to ex uh, extend uh, or uh, AI based ideas or AI based NGFW. So, and the next one would be the pure academic as well as the technical. So it's a scientific research, and it's based on uh, too many scientific-based experiments, like uh, the case study that I prepared for you uh, today. 
And uh, the third item, which is very really important, is that within these kind of solutions, because you're going to uh, actually teach your uh, own solution to how uh, your ideas or your NGFW uh, would take action against different type of traffic, against different type of behavior. So this is a good way. Uh, this is not a 100% <laughs> solution, but this is a very good way uh, to mitigate uh, zero-day vulnerabilities or even uh, not 100%, but 80, 85% uh, mitigation against zero-day attacks or even detection of zero-day attack on earlier states. So the next one uh, would be the, uh, the speed. So it would be a real-time solution. And also, you can fine-tune it as well. Uh, so I also mentioned in the last item here, uh, you can fine-tune your solution to have to reach to a best performance, to reach to a best uh, real-time protection as well. So here is our architecture, uh, if I would say very, very uh, brief. So first, we need uh, training data. So uh, uh, we need some sort of rules, parameters, and patterns, I mean, uh, for training our data. So second, we need uh, some sort of models, machine learning models. So we have uh, different sort of machine learning models like supervised learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning as well. So based on the current status of the solution, we can take advantage of one of those. So for example, if we need a combination of the uh, supervised and unsupervised in some cases after building the first version of the solution, we can use a reinforcement learning. Or if we want to start and deploy our own solution, we can start with the supervised learning like uh, this case study. And the third item will be our objectives, our goals. Uh, so it depends on the, on, the, on the solution. So for example, if you want to tackle the uh, web-based attack, it would be something different. Or if you want to tackle IP backbone-based attacks, it would be something different as well. So today, I have uh, some sort of case study on a very rare uh, segment called uh, NVIOT, or a narrowband Internet of Things, I, th I would say, because, uh, yeah, uh, uh, nowadays, we are, we are using too many uh, NB-IoT-enabled devices uh, from our home or smart home devices through our vehicles and uh, our, uh, it actually uh, involved in our daily routines and day-to-days, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I chose uh, NB-IoT for today. And, uh, yeah, so the model deployment is very simple. So first of all, we need uh, to split the data and all, all of our information into uh, testing and training. So for training, we will train within our algorithms, and uh, this would be the vital part of the deployment and making our own uh, uh, ideas, actually. And after that, we need the testing data as well. So if we have a bunch of data, we have to split uh, all the data into a testing uh, section and a training section. And the next uh, step would be uh, actually a model, selecting the best model, which works for us right now. For example, uh, I used a supervised learning model. And uh, actually, the next step would be the fitting the model and training it uh, within our selected uh, machine learning-based pattern and model, and building uh, the train data as well as the testing data for the final stage that would be the deployment. So uh, yeah, to do the to do the testing and deploying, so you have to collect your own data, or even you have to use some uh, predefined data and, uh, which already collected within different uh, segments. So 
if you want to use some predefined uh, data sets, actually, you can use too many open source uh, data sets. You can find uh, within too many uh, ac academic section, actually, like the CIS IDS, uh, which is for uh, a university in a university in Canada, I think, or KDD99 or KDD COP as well. So also, we have too many other uh, predefined data sets as well. If you want to choose uh, one of those, it is possible. But it depends on your solution. It depends on your deployment. So, but I highly recommend to use your own data and collect your data by deploying uh, a mirroring or gathering the traffic from your network perimeters or edge of your network or even, I don't know, where, is, where you can find uh, different type of uh, traffic like uh, malicious traffic and some uh, sort of normal traffic as well. So, uh, yeah. You need, uh, I want to say about uh, a feature engineering and, and uh, training a machine learning model or pattern. So for the feature engineering, uh, you need uh, to know about the current status of your project. You mean, uh, if you are dealing with uh, IP backbone things, so you must know about the TCP, UDP, uh, uh, stuff and also different type of protocol types like ICMP and uh, to, to make sure about the uh, feature engineering part of your solution. And the second part would be the, uh, the learning model. So uh, based on the current status, you have to choose the best model which is working for you. And uh, for example, you can use different type of uh, modeling as well. But for this uh, case study, I used uh, 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 forest. And also, you can use decision tree as well, which is uh, some sort of academic things. Uh, but also, there are some predefined uh, uh, training model. So you can take advantage of those. They are open source and free as well. OK, and the solution, uh, how is the solution? So yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, I use the supervised learning for, to have a classification and regression. So the all things that I used, uh, which was uh, the vital part, was the uh, performing the supervised learning model on my uh, training data. And after that, I used uh, to start labeling on different sort of traffics. All things else is about uh, uh, make a difference between benign and malicious traffic, actually. So after I got the information from my network perimeter, for example, or any kind of uh, test bed, I don't know, uh, you can try to labeling your traffic, for example. Uh, yeah, it's it's very very important for you because your 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 system is going to learn. It's a baby. It's some kind of baby. You must teach your own system and labeling within your prior knowledge. And after a while, uh, you can see that uh, the, the the learning model is going to be more powerful. And it doesn't matter. It would, uh, for example, be three months, one month, or even a year to learn uh, to have a, a good learning time frame i would say but uh yeah and the, the, the diagram here is uh clearly uh, demonstrating the whole process like the data collection which i uh, i mentioned before is very important you have to collect your data uh, it doesn't matter i i also uh, uh, collected my data from uh, some sort of radio access network part uh, which is uh, really close and uh, which has a relationship with some sort of NVIOT sensors. So uh, after that, I try to have a training based on my model, which was a supervised. And after that, I try to classify the data and uh, review and update uh, the data for the, for the training, I would say. And after that, it's a life cycle here. 
uh, until you get the proper results and performance from your model, from your uh, project, based on your period experiments. So you, before the, the final deployment, you have to test it out. You have to test it out and check the differences between the benign and malicious traffic, for example. And uh, uh, after that, you can have uh, your first deployment and test uh, if it is work uh, properly or not. Uh, yeah, here's the first sample. Uh, so, to do this, uh, I just used uh, an environment to actually to have a, some sort of test bed and uh, emulating the mobile network, um, not core side, I would say radio side. So, to do this, I used OpenLTE, which is an open source and free platform and environment that you can use to deploy different kind of uh, uh, LTE and mobile stuff. And uh, also, I use USRP B210 as well to communicate and send and receive a different type of uh, requests. And also, I used Wireshark as well or any kind of uh, similar tools like T-Shark, TCP dump, etc., to get the responses and analyze the the responses from the sensors and you seems I would say, and yeah, it, it it's not a, a very mandatory option to use these kind of things. You can use it on your layer three networks, or even it would be fully web based, uh, you know. But I used uh, in a very very rare uh, segments in a network actually, so and the achievements was uh, to uh, get the information regarding the master information block and system information blocks, which, we, which is a, uh, a first part of a, a cyber kill chain and attack kill chain once an attacker wants to perform uh, and trigger different sort of uh, attacks against uh, NB IoT devices or even UCMs, subscribers, perform denial of services, etc. So. The achievement was to uh, gathering this kind of information from the network, from a network side, from a sensor side, and uh, put it as on my collected data and uh, segregated into training data and testing data. So, and now. Uh, Next sample, which is uh, some sort of easy catching. Uh, yeah, again, I used the uh, OpenLT besides uh, SRSLT as well to have a deep understanding and uh, control over the uh, radio access network or EU train in a, in a radio side, I would say. And also, again, USRP B210. So as you can see, it is possible to get uh, uh, the EMC number of uh, too many subscribers. And in this case, subscribers means uh, different NVIOT sensors that we are using to uh, automating different things. And also, you can see the usage of NVIOT in uh, automation, in different industries, in critical infrastructure, uh, I would say. And yeah, they're, they're all using uh, some sort of they are actually, I would say, they are subscribers. Like uh, me here, I have a mobile phone, I have a SIM card in that. Uh, the SIM card has a MC number, which is a unique uh, parameter for me. Uh, and it's a unique identifier globally, I would say. And yeah, that's very important for everybody. And the MC number is fully confidential. So the attack was uh, some sort of uh, attacking against IMZ and catching uh, um, uh, too many IMZ numbers in an environment, or even performing uh, uh, sniffing attack, denial of service attack, mass denial of service attacks against too many subscribers, I would say too many NVIOT based sensors uh, in a field. So as you can see based on the Wireshark screenshot here, uh, it is possible to get the IMC number of uh, a sensor 
or a subscriber, I would say, and uh, I got the, these information as well within the request, too many requests, and the relative responses uh, containing MZ numbers, and also, uh, on the other hand, too many uh, normal requests and responses. And I put all of those together, and I, for example, label this kind of request and responses uh, as a, some sort of malicious attempts, malicious requests, and uh, the relative response as well. And the rest would be uh, white, and the rest would be uh, like uh, benign. So uh, this would be the, one of the sample that I used within the, within the uh, solution. So this is the, some sort of the result from the, from the previous experiment. So as you can see, uh, yeah, you can see the, uh, for example, uh, different results and performance results from the different model. So as I uh, mentioned before, I used the random forest model uh, in this case, and also you can see the results from the decision rules and proposed model. And if you look at the, the, look at the picture, uh, you can see some sort of performance metrics, and performance metrics is based on the false positive ratio, is based on the uh, true positive ratio, and on the other hand, it, it, I, I would say that uh, there are too many other uh, KPIs and uh, too many other uh, performance metrics that you can consider, like the, uh, the accuracy uh, of the results as well, or even you can uh, have a false negative and uh, uh, combination of false negative and the performance results together. But in this case, I only uh, have the performance metrics of the false positive ratio and false negative ratio together. And also, there is no requirement to use uh, only random forest or decision rules. You can, you can use uh, KNN, you can use any other models, you can use any other uh, patterns that you want. It's totally based on your solution. But uh, from my point of view, if you want to start from uh, scratch, I, I would say, it's better to start with supervised learning, and after that, you can combine uh, supervised and unsupervised and fine-tuning the solution, the whole solution, actually, uh, to have a better labeling, to have a better uh, performance results. And this is what is happening uh, from the uh, uh, IDS, ML-based IDS point of view, uh, that I would expect the good differences between the benign traffic and the malicious traffic. So this is the all things that you need to do within your IDS solution, which is uh, ML-based uh, enabled. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much of it. Uh, if there is no question, and also if you want to uh, talk about the, these things or any other thing, and also uh, I have a workshop about 9 p.m. I think uh, on 5G exploitation. Uh, yeah, and I highly recommend to join that session as well. Uh, yeah, we, you can reach out to me, and also we can uh, talk together outside. And yeah, uh, thank you all. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I think it's turned off. Yeah, probably. Oh, it's better. Micro, s'il vous plaît. Uh, now it's better. <laughs> Thank you, Ali, for uh, your presentation. I have one question. Yeah. Is uh, two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is about um, uh, the criteria that you have used for uh, the learning machine, uh, the automatic uh, learning machine. You have said that at one moment that uh, you supervise the learning, yes, but yes. after, there is another thing. So what is your criteria that you are using to, to, to tweak, to learn, uh, to, 
automatically to make uh, learning your machine automatically. And the second question... From a collection perspective or the training perspective? You when mean? you are training it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the second question is, I have seen that you have using the radio interface to, to monitor, huh? This is what I have understand, no? Uh, sorry? You are using the radio interface. Yeah, yeah, radio, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The radio interface. Yes, yes. Uh, but I have seen that you are using uh, open LTE. Yes, exactly. But uh, is it uh, really the fourth generation or you are just uh, using GPRS? Just yeah, yeah, sure. Thank so you. Uh, for the first uh, question, I would say that, yeah, training the model uh, is based on your uh, requirements. What do you want from the IDS? But yeah, basically we want a uh, early detection, an earlier stage of a cyber attack, and we just want to uh, learning, have a better learning from a, from an IDS point of view, I would say. But uh, yeah, the time is very important. For example, after the first deployment you have to deploy your own solution, for example, if you want to have a, some sort of experiment on your own, uh, to place, the, for example, the IDS in somewhere, I don't know. For example, if you have a, a, a private network, you can deploy it somewhere uh, to learn more, 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 and you can update the knowledge base, and also you can see the differences as well. So, and also, there is a possibility to find too many false positives as well. So there is a life cycle. There is a life cycle till you find that the IDS is really good right now within a uh, very good false positive ratio and false negative ratio, you know. It is based on your criteria, you know. It's based on your requirements uh, because it, was a, it wasn't a, a vendor-based solution. It wasn't a commercial-based things. So because of that, we have some sort of standards. We have some sort of frameworks. But from a personal and individual experiment, I would say that it's up to you. And after the first deployment or initial deployment, I would say you have to deploy it and test it every day, for example, and uh, check the results together and compare the results. And you can see that the result from the first day would be something different with the even once you want to compare it with the result of the week number 10. And for this second question, uh, yeah, I, I tried uh, to use uh, OpenLTE or SRSLT as well. So once you want to deploy uh, something in EU TRAN or evolved uh, radio access network in LTE, you can use OpenLTE. And uh, it will give you the power of the, the communication between the uh, cell towers like E node Bs in LTE, I would say, uh, together, and you can uh, have the both protocols, same protocols, same interfaces between the uh, E node Bs and cell towers, I would say, and the communication with the with the subscriber, and in this case, the communication with the uh, NBIoT based sensors. You're welcome. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have two quick questions. The yeah. first one, uh, you said in your presentation that uh, it's better if, you, uh, if we use our data sets. But I know, for example, for the ICBS, the, uh, for building uh, KDD or other data sets, uh, it can take more than one year or two years. Yes, exactly. And it's very difficult to labelize our data. Uh, maybe if we have binary detection, uh, normal and abnormal, it's possible. Yeah. But if uh, we must labelize the uh, data in uh, multi criteria or multi uh, uh, multi attacks uh, labelization, yes, exactly. it will be very difficult. So for you, how can we build quickly our, uh, our data set and uh, labelize the, our data set? And uh, sometimes we even don't know what, uh, what type of ac attacks uh, uh, we are in front of. So that's the first question. The second question, 
uh, I didn't understand uh, uh, catching in the uh, parts. How can this part help us in uh, anomaly detection using uh, machine learning? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, good question. Uh, for the first question, my answer is you have to uh, use the proper data set. You can uh, find uh, too many predefined data sets, uh, as I mentioned before, and also uh, you pointed to some of those. So also, some of those open source and free data sets, you can find some with uh, a good labeling and a normalization, which is a, another vital part of the uh, data set that you want to use. Uh, and also, there are some, also some more raw data sets that gives you a power to have a more modification and edits on those data sets together. Uh, but also, uh, a good data set is a, is a, it's based on the, your requirements. And it would be a data set from a week, from three months, or from a year or two years of uh, including uh, too many benign traffic, too many benign requests, as well as too many malicious traffic as well. But uh, if you want to have a individual experiments, you can use some sort of very small data set, like uh, uh, this one, and also this is an, uh, the answer of your second question. This one, I only deploy it as a, a radio-based LTE uh, IDS, which is enabled by the power of the uh, machine learning uh, uh, patterns and algorithms. And uh, yeah. The, the environment that I used in this experiment was NB-IoT. So it doesn't matter. You can use it in IP environment, layer 3, or even layer 7, or any other uh, industries, like even uh, industrial control systems. I don't know any kind of environment that you can use. There is no requirement. But I you chose uh, this one that I, I was thinking that this is very rare uh, segment, and it would be uh, fair enough to talk about uh, this new uh, environment and combine it with this uh, ML-based IDS within the NB-IoT uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, one and two. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. No <laughs> well, it was very interesting. Uh, my question is more or less related to the question just before. Uh, is uh, did you and uh, how did you handle, if you did it, uh, the overfitting problem? Uh, has your model is based on the supervised uh, model, so with labeled data? Uh, what about, uh, are you able to detect uh, uh, kind of attack that are more or less uh, linked to what was already labeled, but may differ a little, may have some variation? So, for instance, how did you handle the overfitting problem? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, we did uh, too many similar experiments together in parallel. Uh, I would say it was uh, three months of gathering the data, if I would say very accurate, uh, a little bit more than three months. Uh, and after that, we try to, during, the, during that three months, during that time frame, we also try to send some of these malicious requests as well, like uh, two examples that I shown uh, during the presentation. So after that, we try to split uh, out all the information into uh, training data and uh, testing data. So also, we perform the experiment in parallel together, and we try to uh, get the results for almost five months, and we try to compare the different results. So uh, to be honest with you, uh, till month number four, we couldn't get the very good results after the initial deployment. Uh, um, yeah. I would enable, I could enable to send too many different malicious requests without any detection ratio. But after that, we try to improve it within, a, within our KPIs, within our parameters. But these KPIs, it depends on your criteria. It depends on your requirements. So like in this kind of things, like in NB-IoT section, we had uh, some of our criteria, like 
AMZ catching, like uh, gathering the subscriber and sensors information, performing denial of service attacks, you know, these kind of things. And we try to put all of those into our training data sets and training model. And we try to have a more and more training. And we compare the results together. And this, uh, that diagram was not a, <laughs> a simple and uh, only <laughs> results because we had too many failures before that. Any Are other clear? question? Another question? No. Hello, thank you for Hello. the presentation. I have one more question about um, the evolution of the normal traffic during the time. If the accuracy uh, go down after one year or more time of uh, running? Thank you. I'm not sure that uh, I understood the, the whole question, but I, I think uh, you asked about the uh, the time frame between we uh, actually gathered the benign data and the malicious data. Yeah, am, am I right? Okay, yeah. Uh, I said that, yeah, it's, uh, it took around uh, three months because it was a very individual and more academic-based uh, experiment. So we tried to get both benign and uh, malicious data because it was on our own, you know? Once we started the open LTS, RSLTS stuff, yeah, we got the benign data, <laughs> okay? From the sensors and as well as the network interfaces that we emulated on uh, Linux operating system. Okay, and once we wanted to get the malicious data, I only try to uh, hit the enter button and send some sort of uh, crafted packets and uh, trying to get the MIV, SIV information uh, as well as the catching uh, those nice CMC numbers, you know, this kind of stuff. And also, for example, performing denial of service, etc. And in that case, we were sure that, yeah, this, these, these kind of things is our, our malicious traffic. But if you want to test it in a while, and also if you want to test it and deploy it in an enterprise or even uh, some sort of live uh, environment, it would be a little bit more hard to have a differentiate between the benign and malicious data. You have to validate the data. This is another additional step. Another question? Anyone? Okay, so we can thank you very much. Yeah, thank Mr. you. Mr. Ali Abdullahi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.